Marquee Backstage was created to share life stories of artists and to reveal who they are when no one is looking. This season, we're going to share personal stories of loss, love, abuse, and hope. Now, these artists are drastically different, but they all share a passion for music, which has helped them conquer their most difficult moments. Let's kick things off at the historic Capital Arts Center with the uber-talented Americana artist, India Ramey. This is Marquee Backstage, season five. India Ramey, I am so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me. So you know what, we're here getting ready at the Capitol. But this room, this building was first created for vaudeville acts back in the 1890s. That now I get to be here to tell your life story. Totally an honor. You started in Georgia. Yes. You grew up there, mm -hmm. Alabama, mm -hmm. Tennessee. Southern girl at heart, we have that in common. Yes, absolutely. Tell me what young India was like in Georgia. Um, young India was always performing. Uh, my mom will tell you that uh, even even when the the missionaries would come to our house, you know, to preach the gospel to us. I was like, oh, I've got an audience. I'm going to go in the back, put on a costume, and come out and perform some kind of act for them. And they, they came to our house a lot, and I think that's why. They, 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 thought they that. knew that they were going to be entertained when they, they got They were like, this child needs Jesus. <laughs> She's just begging for us to come back. It's yes. a calling. Yeah, I was a show. So, did you intend to leave Georgia? Did you have plans when you were younger that you just wanted to get out and do your own thing? Yeah. Or was that really just where life took you? I went to the Alabama School of Fine Arts in Birmingham and um, I was a ballet dancer then, a very serious ballet dancer. I did that for, for, for many, many years. Now, what happened in your life to make you go, okay, you know what, this is actually what I was meant to do? I guess when I was in like 10th or 11th grade, um, I realized that I wasn't going to be a professional ballet dancer, and so I was like, "What am I going to do with my life?" You know, and and this whole time, mind you, I've been you know singing in my car, singing in the shower, and and making the whole you know dorm hallway listen to me sing Kathy Matea, Eighteen Wheels and a Dozen Roses." I can't see that at all. And um, <laughs> and um, but like, but I never, I never thought that I was. A, a great singer like I never thought that that was my future either I it was just something that I dearly loved to do right. and honestly I had no idea that that's all you need was just to love to do it um, but so like I was like I got to get my life together and figure out what I'm gonna do and my mom was like well you're real good at arguing you'd be a great lawyer <laughs> so um, so I started studying really hard and got my grades up and uh, got into a good college and I was just laser focused that I was going to be a lawyer and I went to the University of Alabama and got my law degree and passed the bar um, and thank goodness I passed it on the first try because when I finished taking that test I was like I'm never doing this again and I don't like if I don't pass then you know I'm gonna give it up to God or whatever um, but uh, I went to to be a prosecutor for domestic violence. And um, I did that because I was, I'm a domestic violence survivor. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't interested in being a lawyer just for the sake of the law. So I had to find something that I was passionate about and helping people who've gone through, you know, what my mother went through and, and what I went through was really important to me. And I had already been doing um, volunteerism, you know, with domestic violence shelters and stuff like that. So that's that's what led me into being a prosecutor. Well, the advocacy, just knowing that your voice was big enough to impact others, but to know that your voice could be used in place of some that didn't want to use theirs or were too scared to use theirs. Yeah, yeah. That's a total game changer. I felt like I was particularly and uniquely situated to help people because I could honestly tell them I have been through what you're going through. Well, wait, sorry. <laughs> well, I've been down so bad lately, I don't know what to do. Can't seem to get away from all the gloom and doom. Every time I No good. Well, put me on the 
show tonight I'm up to no good A lot of the victims that I worked with, it was easier for them to believe me when, you know, when they couldn't really decide if they were okay with their husband going to prison, right. you know. And I would say, give me three months, give me three months without him in your life driving you crazy and being worried that he's going to kill you every day. Give me three months and come back and you'll thank me. And I actually had some, some of them come back and thank me. <laughs> Really they learned did. how yeah. to breathe again. Yes. Because in that environment, there is no way to catch your breath. No, no. Somebody's always thinking for you and somebody's always setting the rules and changing the rules every second. So it, it, it really will make you feel like you're going crazy. Absolutely. So when you went home at the end of the day, when you were a district attorney, you take on the stories and the pain of every single person you come in contact with. Um, and this was sort of like a um, kind of a young and naive mistake that I made. I, like I didn't, when I was in my 20s and I was doing this, I didn't realize that I had PTSD. I thought that I was just like this really strong, tough young woman that had, you know, I've been through some tough stuff, but I'm tougher, you know, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make it all better. You know, like I'm, I'm gonna make it all worth it by channeling into this and helping people but what actually happened was it triggered my PTSD really hard and I was terrified all the time. I was having panic attacks and um, you know crying every weekend because I was worried about my victims and I didn't know if they were if I was going to see them on Monday and um, it was a big it was a big PTSD trigger so I, I couldn't do it for very long. I had to I had to move on. <laughs> but it taught you something about yourself and it made you face your own pain. Yeah. It, it made you face your own insecurities and weaknesses that strong women typically don't like to admit that they have. Yeah. 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 It's you know, whenever you've been through trauma, one of the difficult things to admit is that you are vulnerable and one of the difficult things to be is vulnerable. Um, because you, you're hardwired to have all those defense mechanisms that keep you alive, you know? Like you're, you're just a warrior every single day. You have to be. Yes, just, just staying alive. And you don't realize, you know, after you get away with it, you don't realize that you carry all those defenses and all those weapons with you and they can, they can keep you from, from growing if you're, if you're not addressing them. I'm not aware of them. So you came to the realization that you really don't need to continue to drag yourself through that every day. Yeah, I talked to my mom about it and um, you know, I told her, I, I said, I'm not enjoying it the way I thought I would and it's making me a nervous wreck. And I just, I feel like, I don't know what I need to do, but I, I need to do something else. And, and she said, she said, India, you don't have to do this for me. She, she said, I'm living my life without domestic violence and I'm not having to talk about it every day and deal with it every day and Lord knows you shouldn't either. She was like, You're, you were a child when that happened. So she, she was like, this is not your cross to bear. Why don't you try living life without this being your everyday dialogue? Right. So that was the only, that was the permission I needed <laughs> to go on and do something else. Yeah, she released you. Yeah. She to did. find your true passion, mm -hmm. which shines through every single day. Yeah, yeah. But listening to your music really uncovers a lot of your deepest thoughts and deepest emotions. You know, I connected yeah. to you before we ever met because you have one song that we both lived, mm -hmm. and that's saying goodbye. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know another human being lived that like yeah. I did. Yeah. And it's, and like we were talking about earlier, you know, a lot of the times when you go through something like that where you have um, a toxic parent, especially when it's a parent that's toxic and so damaging to, you know, to young minds and hearts, you tend to feel like you're the only one because um, everybody else around you seems normal, normal, and, you know, they have, why can't I have nice parents like that? And, and you know, like, um, so it's, it, I feel like writing about those things 
because I'm always trying to help. You know, I, I have a, I have a you know a servant's heart, and I want to help people. And I feel like when I write about those things, it does help somebody at least know that they're not alone. You've wiped the dirt off your hands and walked away. There's not enough perfume in the world that stink gets better every day. Somebody knows where the bodies are buried and they won't rest until your debts are paid. year I've been in a lot of intensive therapy to address my PTSD and all this stuff and I, I cannot sing saying goodbye right now I can't like I, and I don't know when I'm going to be able to and I don't know I really like I don't really want to sing baby either right now it's just um, I'm there with it right now like I'm sitting with all that emotion right now and it's very real again so um, maybe one day I'll be able to sing those songs again. But I think your emotion's still coming out and, and your feelings are still coming out in new music. Yeah. And you have amazing new music. Let's talk about where you've been since you started the therapy. Let's talk about what that has created for you to be able to look forward. I didn't want to go into writing a song unless I knew it was going to be a good one, you know? <laughs> like, because being an overachiever is also a a, a trauma response so um, I've just been writing about everything so I have a ton of new songs that nobody's heard yet that at some point I'll record and put out in the world. How has he been through all of the therapy? I always say that Sean Ramey is the best person in the world and I really mean that I really believe it and um, he's been so supportive of me I mean you know it's not every day that you know two lawyers are married and then one lawyer comes home and says, hey, how about if I quit my law job and go all over the place and sing country music? How do you think about, what do you think about that? You know, you know that girl that wanted to save the world and like be an advocate for all these people who had no voice? Right. Well, now right. I'm just gonna sing about it. Yeah, yeah, I just wanna, I wanna, be, I just wanna sing country music, man. And he's, he's very supportive. He's my biggest fan. But that's where you and he really are. It's you two against the world. Yes. It's a whole new beginning. Yeah, I really feel that way. He has been the most supportive he's ever been because he knows how hard this is for me. And he also knows, 
he knows and he believes in the healing. And he can see, even when I can't see that it's working, he can see that it's working. And it's making our relationship better. It's making our marriage stronger. It's making me, it's helping me be the person that I want to be and I can be um, by, you know, shedding all those defense mechanisms and just like letting my own self come out. Like there are so many people who need to know more about you and connect with you. Are you working on your next project? Mm -hmm. Do you have things that you are, sh are waiting to share that are going to blow people away? Because every time you come out with new music, it's like, what? <laughs> Where did she pull that from? I hope it. I hope it blows people away. I mean, I've been writing, like I said, I've been writing like crazy, and I've I've come to the decision recently that it's it's very important for me to admit to people that I am a country artist. You know, <laughs> Kathy Matea. <laughs> yeah, like all that Kathy Matea stuff and and Shania and Faith and, and you know Reba and all that stuff. So um, I've been working in some some countryer uh, things and and. I'm also trying to have some a little bit more fun with it too, you know. I've got I mean I've got some really serious songs that I've written that are like almost academic because they're they're so layered. But then, you know, I've got just some like some honky tonk bangers that just tap your toe too, you know. <laughs> it's always a good time with you, but you've shed that skin and now it's like let's take on the world. Yeah, yeah. Like I just I just wanna have a really good time with telling the stories. Well, any story with you is a good time. And I've Thank loved you. sharing stories with you today. Thank you. I've enjoyed it too. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Shook me through.